Chapter 27, Planning a Party. Hey, you guys, if you're new to, to my channel, please subscribe. If you uh, are a regular listener, please smash that like button so this video will get picked up by the YouTube algorithm. I haven't updated this story in about a month, so any likes would be appreciated so people know I will continue to post weekly updates on this story. Now came the time that Matt had been waiting for. Under his direction, the beam that sterilized trains crossing the border was shut off. Ten doctors and twenty nurses, plus equipment, medicine, and all the other, other things they would need arrived safely and were loaded into hovercrafts. With them came a dozen hovercraft pilots and a hundred new bodyguards recruited from Scotland and Ireland. This was urged by Daft Donald to shore up security. The new people went to paradise for orientation and training. All of the medical staff stayed there except for one who came to the hospital in Ajo. With the money Matt was paying them, he wanted them to, to concentrate on working with Dr. Rivas. Nurse Fiona was reassigned to washing dishes. She complained so bitterly that Matt gave her the job of watching listen, although this didn't stop the complaints. Why do you think, who, what do you think I am? A bloody babysitter? She yelled to Celia. That little scrap is the devil's spawn. She's got a, a mouth on her that would do a sailor proud. The train returned to Atslan bearing Esperanza's samples and several tons of opium. Matt felt guilty about continuing the trade, but it was only a temporary measure. The cookie cans outside the opium factory by now extended half a mile, and the dealers in Africa, Europe, and Asia were getting hysterical. Happy Man, Hikwa, glass Eye, Debengwa, representative called again and again. At first, Matt ignored him. The last thing he wanted to do was deal with glass Eye. But Cienfuegos pointed out that this would look like a weakness to the sinister drug lord. I've seen him at El Patron's parties, the jefe said. He has an instinct for terrorizing the weakest person in the room. He killed the old man of the mountains, who you may remember was in charge of the Iraqi cartel. Matt remembered the old man of the mountain had once been feared and dreaded drug lord. He was one of 120 years old by the time Matt saw him. Broken by the illness and stoked by the eyeballs with, with the hashish, glass I had sat next to him at a banquet. The boy couldn't hear what the, what the African said, but he saw the effect on, on the old man. The Iraqi tried to move away, but glass I detained him with a heavy hand, and then the old man slumped face down into a plate of mashed potatoes. I should have changed the seating arrangement, El Patron had said, in a mellow mood after the banquet. Something about glass eye brings on heart problems. Oh well, there is a silver lining. The old man's customs, customers are up for grabs. Matt remembered this now as he assessed the holoport and found um, Happy Man's new address. He was no longer in Africa. He had a new address in marijuana on the eastern border of opium, and his light was blinking furiously. Happy Man Hikwa was sitting in front of the portal. There was an ashtray full of cigarette butts, a, po a pot of coffee, and a bottle of... and a bottle of... Aguardante. I might be mispronouncing that. Sorry, guys. A villainous Mozambican vodka that smelled like crushed beetles. Uh, this word spelled... If you want to look this up, A G U A R D E N T E. Hikwa looked like he'd been living in front of the portal. His clothes, a plaid suit without a shirt, were dirty, and Matt could smell stale marijuana smoke. He was a drug addict. Matt smiled to himself. Drug addicts were the easiest clients to handle. They would agree to anything. You, you, said Happy Man having difficulty forming the words, You child! Where is Mr. Alcaran? I am the new lord of opium, said Matt. Mr. Alcaran is busy. What do you want? 
It took a moment for the African dealer to process this information. You're a clone, he finally said. Clones can't run businesses. I am El Patron, said Matt, smarting from the insult. Happy Man pushed away from the screen. Behind him was a room in the chaos full of old food containers and weapons, and beyond was a wide window showing a city. Matt could see the skyscrapers chopped in two as though a giant machete had sliced through them. A line of limousines, not unlike Hitler's old car, was making its way through rubble. What's going on? asked Matt. Hikawa looked to where the boy was pointing. Oh, oh that. We're still pacifying the city. A few of the farm patrolmen are holding out. A flash followed by the screams showed a building being blown up. Fires raged in the distance. You're destroying your own city, said Matt, appalled. Happy Man giggled. We don't need it. We've got more. He reached for the bottle of aguardente and took a swig. Anyway, this place was a, a ruin when we got it. It used to be called Ciudad Juarez. Okay, so the Ciudad Juarez, you guys, is right across the border from El Paso, Texas. And the crotters who ran this place were trying to rebuild. Fat chance. Glass eye showed them what's what. We, he hiccuped, put all their women and children into an empty swimming pool and used them for target practice. Matt had seen enough. No way was he going to open the border for a shipment to Dabangwa. He reached off for the um, off button. Hey, you can't go. We need our opium, cried happy man Hikawa. By that time, the hollow port had closed. Matt sat, shaken by what he'd seen. He knew things were just as bad in the old dope confederacy, but this mindless destruction was worse than anything he'd imagined. He accessed, he accessed addresses in Nuevo Laredo and Matamoros. In each one, a window showed a scene of devastation. What kind of country was Glass Eye building? He and his men acted like a swarm of locusts. Matt had seen on an old TV show. Eat one field, move on to the next. You need infinite fields to keep an army like that going. Matt found a few portals in the rural areas where marijuana and tobacco were grown. The crops had withered and the bodies of the Egypt's filled dry canals. He was too exhausted to look anymore. Even though the holoport had adjusted to a slightly different handprint, the scanner still made him nauseated. He went to El Patron's apartment and lay down. The windows opened onto green lawns and the odors of flowers and cut grass drifted in. The sound of Egypt's using scissors to trim the lawns soothed him. El Patron's empire was evil, all right, but it was still alive. Soon Matt promised himself he would rip out the opium and plant different crops. Cattle would be turned um, onto healthy fields of grass. When the Egypt's were free, he would offer them jobs as normal, normal farmers and they'd go back to whatever lives they'd had before. It would be their choice. Far fewer were dying now that, that Matt had added meat and vegetables to their diet. His days were packed with work, learning to ride real horse, horses, flying a hovercraft, and even driving Hitler's old car with Daft Donald at his side. The seat was pushed forward so he could reach the pedals, and he enjoyed the cheers from the gardeners and farm patrol. Viva El Patron! Viva El Patron! Viva El Patron! They shouted, as though the old man had been reborn. Sometimes Matt had the creepy feeling that El Patron was actually sitting in the back seat, admiring his kingdom from the dark halls of the dead. This is the most excitement I've had in years, the old man said, grinning with delight. Matt shivered. He knew the back seat was empty, but he didn't turn around to look. Best of all was planning the party. It would be the greatest celebration ever in opium. Tantan, Chacho, and Fidelito were coming on the next train, and their eyes would drop when they, when they saw what Matt had arranged. They would have a circus, a professional soccer game, a rodeo, a guitarist from Portugal, and food undreamed of by boys who had lived in a plankton factory. Tantan had eaten rice. Tantan had eaten ice cream only a few times in his life, and Fidelito had um, only seen pictures of it. So many wonderful experiences lay in store for Matt's compadres, or his friends. He had only had to stretch out his hand, and whatever he wanted was his. 
Cienfuegos had been correct about Esperanza. She seemed to have forgotten about Major Beltran's existence and had little interest in anything besides the plant and animal samples. Matt managed one unsatisfactory with meeting with Maria. With her, mother present, and called the girl his no novia openly. Esperanza only gave him a tight smile that reminded him of a, of a sprung mousetrap. As for Cienfuegos, he was short-tempered for reasons Matt couldn't discover. The, Matt was ne the man was never rude, and yet the boy sensed a gathering tension. It worried him, and finally he um, approached Celia about it. He's being foolish, Celia said. He knew that Dr. Rivas would do. He knew what Dr. Rivas would do when the new staff arrived. Dr. Rivas was going to train them, said Matt. Is there something else I should know about? Oh dear, said Celia, putting down the soap ladle, the soup the soup ladle she was holding and wiping her hands on her apron. New staff can't just be turned loose in opium. What are you talking about? Matt said queasy, feeling that things had moved out of his control. Remember what I said about the bodyguards and farm patrolmen being microchipped? What do you mean? I didn't tell you, Dr. Revis. I didn't tell Dr. Revis to alter their brains, cried Matt in horror. They're violent men, Celia said. El Patron said the chipping them was no different from a rancher turning bulls into steers. Left alone, bulls fight, and it's dangerous for anyone around them. That's why Major Beltran had to die. He intended to kill you when he discovered you were the only Alcoran left. San Fuegos understood. You knew about the murder? You were in favor of it? Matt was astounded that this woman who had sung him lullabies when he was a small child, but who but who had also coldly watched El Patron die. I may be only a cook, but I've I've been close to the center of power for fifteen years, said Celia. You don't rule a country by being weak. Thousands have died in opium and will keep on dying if we don't do something. The drug trade is too powerful to stop without shedding blood. God will forgive our, us our sins if we manage to stamp it out. Matt, said, Matt sat down, feeling that the room had suddenly filled with shadows. El Patron had shot down a passenger plane to avert a war. Esperanza felt righteous about killing the Egypts and cocaine. Dr. Rivas held power, held poor Bongeni hostage to fend off glass eye. Where did it all end? How much wickedness, how much wickedness could you do in the service of good before it turned into pure evil? Evil. Cienfuegos blames me for microchipping the new bodyguards, said Matt. He's too personally involved, Celia said. What exactly is the effect of the process on him? Matt asked. The woman frowned. You know the chips keep him from harming you or leaving the country. They also forbid him to feel pity or love. Matt thought about the heffy's reaction to Listen's tears. The man had clearly wanted to comfort the little girl, but he dared not do it. If he had touched her, what would have happened? Would he have uh, doubled up in agony as he had, as he had when he attacked Matt? Cienfuegos is, is a very unusual man, concluded Celia after a moment's thought. He fought like a tiger when the farm patrol first caught him. Very strong-minded people have have more resistance to microchips. Without being asked, she dished up a bowl of soup for Matt and sat out and set out bread still warm from the oven. The boy wished she would sit with him, but Celia no longer thought of it. Thought of it was was proper. He ate without much. He ate without much appetite. Santa Fuegos did care about people. Matt thought he liked. He like listen, pest thought. She, he liked listen, pest though she was, and and he was upset about the new bodyguards. It was there under the surface, and it was driving him mad. Matt finished his meal with a dulce de leche ice cream covered in marshmallow sauce. How Fidelito would like that when he when he arrived. The thought cheered Matt up, and he made plans to find more things to delight the little boy. 
By the way, you don't have to keep paying the doctors and nurses those outrageous salaries, said Celia, removing his, his dishes to the sink. They've been microchipped too. You can't have... You can't have people who hold power of life and death out of control either. Matt eagerly watched the train cross the border on the holoport screen. Workers unloaded suitcases and carried them to the waiting hovercrafts. Wonderful, magical passengers disembarked and stretched their legs in the shimmering desert heat. First, a group of musicians, five men and one woman, got out carrying their instruments. They removed their coats and looked around to see what must have been a land of fables to them, a zombie kingdom ruled by an ancient vampire. They wouldn't realize the workers around them were zombies. Next came a group of cowboys for the rodeo, short, raw-boned men who seemed made of gristle and steel. Their leather jackets were scuffed from um, being thrown from, from horses. After the rodeo, Matt planned to stage a, pancha, a panchanga, a kind of bullfight where no animal got killed. The soccer players from Brazil and Argentina were taller than the cowboys and moved with easy grace like thoroughbred horses. Matt had never seen a soccer match because El Patron didn't like sports. He said the only games with real risk were suitable for men. The sport he approved of was, uh, was called Pacatac and had been played by the ancient Maya. It was somewhere similar to soccer. The players used a hard rubber ball, which they weren't allowed to touch with their hands, and scored points by knocking it through a, st through a stone ring. It was more like a religious ceremony than a game, El Patron said, a symbolic battle between life and death. The winning team represented life, and the losers who represented death got their heads cut off. Ooh. A troop of tightrope walkers and trapeze artists hauled equipment out of the train. Long ago, circuses had contained lions and tigers, but now those animals were extinct. Except here, Matt thought happily. Wrestlers followed, walking with a, a rolling gait as though they were already in the arena. They were dressed in Levi's and t-shirts, but inside their suitcases were customers that would transform them into creatures of fantasy. Matt watched anxiously as the performers were flown off to Adjo. He wasn't going to let them anywhere near Dr. Rivas. And anyhow, they were short-time visitors. Now the door of the last car opened, and out tumbled Fidelito, pursued by Tantan and Chacho. Matt could almost hear Tantan shout, c c Come on, come back, or I'll beat the stuffing out of you. But he knew the boy would never do it. And so did Fidelito. The little boy danced around, kicking off sprays of sand. Then a fourth person stepped out of the train. Sore Artem Artemisia. Matt's heart leapt to his throat. Maria was on the train. She had to be. Esperanza had relented at the last moment and decided that he was good enough for her daughter. Matt watched in, 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 in a f a f a f a fervor as the nun stepped down carefully and grimaced when her feet touched the hot sand. She gave a command and Fidelito immediately stopped prancing and took her hand. Together they walked to the last remaining hovercraft. Workers swarmed over the train to remove the cartons of supplies. Maria never appeared.